my name is Stephen Reiner from the Alan Olda Center for Communicating Science, and this is Science on Tap. My guest tonight is Dr. Youssef Hanoun, who is the director of the Stony Brook University Cancer Center and a distinguished cancer researcher. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, a subject that um, really concerns all of us. It's a subject that we're worried about or we're scared of or we know someone who is dealing with it. It has very famously been called the emperor of all maladies. It is the subject, the target of America's longest war, which is not the war in Afghanistan, but the war against cancer, which began officially in 1971 when President Richard Nixon declared a war on cancer. And since that time in the United States and around the world, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent to fight cancer. So welcome. My question to you, first of all, is I am a patient. I just have received a diagnosis. It is a form of cancer. Perhaps it's prostate cancer. Perhaps it's another kind of cancer. Should I be hopeful as compared to if this happened to me 10 years earlier? Should I be more optimistic today? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we are genuinely, I think, on the cusp of immense changes happening in cancer medicine based on decades of research that have just galloped in the past few years. Uh, when I started in cancer medicine and cancer research over 30 years ago, it was the dark ages. And the definition of the dark ages is you couldn't tell time. Things were static. You couldn't tell if a year was a new year or a previous year. Th things were the same. Things were not changing. And now they're changing almost on a daily basis. There's been an explosion of research at multiple levels. Uh, levels of the genetics of cancer, what we call genomics of cancer, meaning dissecting the sequence of a tumor and finding out where the mutations are in a specific tumor, even in the progeny of that specific tumor, meaning as the tumor divides and grows and metastasizes, we, we can analyze a lot of that and figure out what's changing, what's more important than other, what's more important than other things in terms of driving those changes. Uh, this is coupled with research on cell, the cell biology of cancer cells, how cancer cells can migrate, how they divide, how they can resist hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen, how they derive their metabolism from sugar and other nutrients, uh, we un how they can metastasize to dif distant sites and to spread, to spread to and be able to live in a different organ that's usually extremely hostile to a normal cell from a different tissue. Well, understanding the behavior and the metabolism and the chemistry of that cancer cell, I think, of course, is at the root of this. But I want to back up a second. There's no such thing as the war on cancer. Such a thing is a misnomer, in a way, is it not? There's no such thing as cancer. It should yeah. be a plural. Yes, I think that's a very critical point to, uh, for people to understand that cancer is a big plural. Uh, there are obviously cancers defined by the tissue of origin, such as, as you mentioned, prostate cancer or breast cancer or liver cancer. But within each of these tissues, there are subdivisions and subdivisions of cancer, so different types. And as we get more into the genomics of cancer and the cell biology of cancer and the metabolism of cancer, we realize that there are a lot of differences among different types and subtypes of cancer. Is it, is it possible to answer the question, why are, more, why are some cancers more deadly than other cancers? More deadly, more dangerous, more powerful? We understand th that some cancers and in some individuals are much more prone to maybe grow more rapidly. But more critically, they can metastasize and grow in those hostile tissues that otherwise wouldn't have tolerated them. And that's what distinguishes a cancer that's going to act poorly from a cancer that can be controlled either with primary surgery or with, with some treatments up front. What, what is the greatest mystery of the behavior of a cancer cell to you right now? What is the greatest breakthrough that you would like to have when you look into a cancer cell? Yeah, try I, to figure it out. 
th I think here you're committing the error you pointed to, which is it's not one cancer. So we're not going to answer that question in a general way. There will be breakthroughs for each cancer and each subtype of cancer. And the reason I said we're at the cusp of changes is because we've already made, as a community of cancer physicians and researchers, made important progress in rolling back many, some of these cancers. One of the best examples is chronic myelogenous leukemia. That's kind of now the poster child of now, myelogenous, what will that mean? People have heard of leukemia, yeah. but there's various kinds of leukemia. There are various kinds of leukemia, which are cancers of the blood cells, and the chronic myelogenous leukemia is a cancer of one type of white blood cells uh, that just start dividing a lot and acting poorly. And 20 years ago, that diagnosis was a predictable death sentence so that a patient would go through a phase we'd call, we call the chronic phase for usually around three years, then they go through an accelerated phase for a year and a half or so, and then they go through what we call a blast crisis when the cancer really transforms into a super aggressive cancer and was deadly at that point. It was not responsive to the treatments that even the acute myelogenous, acute white cell leukemia would respond to. So it was a, 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 a death sentence. Now, you roll back to the 50s, there was a, a string of research and discovery that started with finding a chromosomal change in that cancer. That led a decade or two, two decades later to understanding that there was a translocation of genes that happened in those tumors, to then understanding that that put two different proteins next to each other. One of them is, is an enzyme, it does things, it's a kinase. And then rolled forward 10 years later, uh, inhibitors were developed against this kinase and then lo and behold that tumor started becoming a controllable tumor meaning you give a treatment against this kinase it's this this mutated gene the protein that's made by this mutated gene and then the chronic myelogenous leukemia starts shrinking and almost disappearing so just because science and medicine have been successful in targeting this particular cancer doesn't necessarily mean the next cancer may benefit from this technology. It may have a whole other kind of approach necessary yeah. to target it. Yes, I think there are key elements in this story that are sort of a paradigm, uh, that you, you do the basic research to understand what's going wrong. You do therapeutics based on identifying those vulnerabilities based on understanding what's wrong in that cancer. And then you roll out these treatments that are targeted against these vulnerabilities. In that case, it was a protein kinase, an enzyme. In other cases, it's not going to be the same thing. So, but the paradigm is kind of similar but more complex because cancer of the lung is more complex than cancer of the blood. It just happens to be much more complex. Many more mutations, many more changes, many more subdivisions. Uh, but the principles are about the same. Understand that cancer, try to find vulnerabilities, and attack these vulnerabilities. So when you say, a, let's say, a lung cancer is more pernicious than another kind of cancer, that means that the cancer cell, the cancerous cell that, 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 that involves lung cancer is, is more complex, is more difficult to understand, it's more difficult to follow, to penetrate, so on and so forth need to understand how that cell works Correct. in and order to kill it. And it's more difficult to treat, and it doesn't respond as readily to treatments that may be more effective in breast cancer or ovarian cancer or even prostate cancer. So it's one of the bad actors. Unfortunately, it's the most common form of cancer we have. But itself is being subdivided. So there is a form of lung cancer that shows much more similarity to the chronic myelogenous leukemia cases. In that situation, there is a subtype of lung cancer that has a mutation in one of the growth factor receptors. This is a protein at the periphery of the cell that responds to incoming signals. And it has a mutation, and that mutation allows that cell and its progeny to grow and grow and become a cancer. There are now inhibitors for that receptor because it's also a kinase has a similar enzymatic activity as the kinase from leukemia. It's a different kinase, needs a different inhibitor, 
but you can roll it back. Before we get to talking about what's <coughs> happening at Stony Brook, yes. um, can you give us, I hate to use the term, but we all know we go to the bookstore, we see the dummy's guide to this, that, and the other thing. So if there was this yellow and black book that had the dummy's guide to the cancer cell, what are the commonalities of cancer cells? How do, we, how do you describe, how could you describe a cancer cell to us? What is it capable of doing? Why is it so powerful? This is a very complex question. So uh, the, the main problem with cancer cells is that cancer cells are really very similar to normal cells. That's the problem. You have a bacteria and a normal human cell. They're so different that any time you find a, a lesion or a vulnerability in a bacterial cell, you can find a m compound that would inhibit it or kill it. So you take an antibiotic that works Take antibiotic, that. you kill there, you hardly do anything to the normal s human cell. So they're so different, and therefore you can separate them and attack this one. When you come to cancer cells, they're like this. There are differences. Back to the chronic myelogenous leukemia, the difference initially is in just one gene out of 20,000. One out of 20,000 is different. One out of 20,000 is different. So you can't just say, I'm going to kill all this and this, because you do that, you're going to kill the normal cell. You really need to find a, either a, to ab be able to target that one gene itself or some of the effects it produces that make the cell vulnerable to those things. So this way you can start separating them apart and attacking the leukemia. But otherwise, it's one out of 20,000. Now, when you come to lung cancer, it's many more genes that are mutated in a lung cancer on average. I, I actually don't know that number off the top of my head, but maybe let's say 30 to 100 is a good range to think of, that genes that are mutated and that are thought to be significant in, in the difference. But still, we're talking about 20 out of 20,000 or 30 out of 20,000. That's not a big difference. So one has to be very clever in terms of figuring out how these differences can be isolated and, and studied and figured out so that we can create a vulnerability out of that small difference. It's like having a tiny window that you need to open and be able to attack that cancer cell. Now back to your question in terms of what makes it a bad actor, this is actually a problem in evolution biology applied to the cell level because you have to think of the cancer as evolving from a progenitor cell and it divides. That progenitor cell meaning an original cell. The original cell. The original cell that acquires some mutation. In the case of chronic myelogenous leukemia, that one mutation, you know, one mutation out of the, in one gene out of 20,000 is sufficient to drive it. You come to lung cancer, well, one mutation is not sufficient to do it. So that cell may look still very normal, and it will divide. And the two progeny, because one divides into two, will still look kind of normal. But over time, one of them may acquire another mutation. And that one may have a slightly more growth advantage over the one with one or zero mutation. That divides. And then maybe one of those progeny gets a third mutation. And that's where you, you get this natural selection operating on this milieu of evolving mutations. And unfortunately, some of the mutations start to happen in the genes and pathways that affect mutation itself. So you get more mutations. And these cells, they want to grow. That's you know, what, what they do, they, because they're no longer normal. They start growing, and then some of them s seep into the bloodstream, and they survive, whereas Many of their relatives don't survive that, so that's another form of selection. Out of those hundred that seep into the blood, maybe one can go to the bone and start living in the bone. Whereas and then that process starts again in the bone. That starts again in the bone. So there's this whole selection, natural selection, occurring in the organism on this substrate of dividing cells that increase their mutations. What is happening at Stony Brook, because you're also the co-director of the Baal Center, which is going to be an extraordinary new facility, which is being called transformative. Uh, what is happening at Stony Brook, which is going to be able to open this window a little farther for you? Yeah, let me take you one step back, which mm -hmm. is 
to articulate one point, which is most of the advances, the fundamental advances against cancer have been really accomplished through hard basic science research in really globally, if you think about it, only a handful of places, maybe 80 different academic centers around the country or 100. It's not that many when you consider a war against cancer mobilizing scientists in 100 academic places. Uh, the, the science has driven a lot of research and discovery. Uh, without that research and discovery, we go back to the Middle Ages. Things would have been static. And there is this progression of events. You discover things in basic science that you may not even know they're going to be relevant to cancer. And then someone picks up on it and says, oh, I can study this cancer cell based on what we understood here. Now, at Stony Brook, we have a cancer center that's fully academic. So it has basic research. It has what's called translational research, meaning we want to take discoveries in the basic laboratories and see how we can foster growth in research on the cancer biology specific front and then we want to translate that even further to the clinical arena so that we can take questions from the clinic and answer them or study them in the lab and we take discoveries from the lab and try to see if we can advance patient care either in diagnostics in biomarkers in therapeutics etc now what we've done at Stony Brook, because there are like 80 cancer centers around the country, we, we decided that we want to exploit unique strength at Stony Brook. And for that, we actually turned to the part of Stony Brook that's the non-medical side, which traditionally thought to be not relevant to cancer research. But it turns out to be an, a very opportune moment in history of cancer, where things such as mathematics, physics, uh, chemistry, uh, biomedical engineering, informatics, computational biology, biochemistry has, have turned to be very critical to, to enable cancer research to move to the next level. Cancer research now, in this new era that we're just at the beginning of, requires a lot of mathematical power. We generate a lot of data. This, uh, we need a lot of computational power. We need a lot of mathematicians to analyze large data sets or figure out pathways and model systems. We need, uh, that's also where physicists can come into well, play. Well, you mentioned physics and, and, and there's, there's a cyclotron that is going to be yeah. put into service. Yeah. A particle accelerator. Now, yeah. when we think of particle accelerators and cyclotrons, we think of cosmology, we think of... Uh, you know, what's going on at CERN, we think of, uh, you know, now you have to think Higgs what's going boson on. Uh, yeah. particle creation of the universe. What does all this have to do with cancer to be using a particle accelerator, which is going to be in operation when the new MART yeah. building We is. have a new cancer center building right. that will have outpatient uh, facilities as well as a lot of research, including this cyclotron. So what does a particle accelerator okay. have to do with cancer? So again, one of the areas of exceptional strength at Stony Brook is in imaging studies. And one is also related to our long-term relationship with Brookhaven National Labs. That got us into thinking about human imaging using PET scanning. This is positron emission tomography. So you, you need to have molecules that emit positrons, which are anti-electrons, positively charged electrons. And those can be detected by special PET scanners. This is so the most uh, familiar to people is what's called FDG PET scanning for cancer. And this is again based on a common theme in most cancers where they are, have a high avidity for glucose, for sugar. So you can create um, an, a molecule that looks like normal sugar but has a fluorine that emits this positron. So when a patient takes that FDG, starts getting concentrated in the tumor and emits positrons and the scanner detects a lesion, detects something that's emitting positrons. You couple that with a CAT scan, with a CT scan where you slice Which through. Which many people are familiar with, fam many people have had Then MRIs you can pinpoint that lesion to the right anatomy. Now, but that's limited to really one molecule based on one property of cancer cells, which is ab ability to take up glucose and kind of take it with high avidity, just kind of 
keep sucking sugar from the blood. So, and that's limited because in this case we're using um, a derivative of fluorine called F18. It's an, an isotope of fluorine that emits positron. Um, but if we have a cyclotron in-house, we can create carbon-11 based compounds. Now, what's carbon-11? It's an isomer of carbon. It also emits positrons. It has a, the, the big disadvantage is it has a short half-life of 20 minutes. The, the big, big advantage is it's carbon. The big advantage is it's carbon, and carbon is present in every molecule in life. So if you, that opens up venues for investigators that we have not even scratched the surface of. Because if someone wants to study the binding of some hormone to a receptor, well, the hormone has carbon. You can insert a carbon-11 there, and you will find where that hormone now is binding that receptor. If you want to find, to study a process by which the cancer cells are invading and you have a target for that, you create a carbon-11 molecule that targets that. Again, back to the disadvantage, has 20 minute half-life. So within four or five half-lives, it's gone. So that's why we're building the cyclotron. It will make the carbon-11 in the form of a carbon dioxide. Right next to it will be a chemistry lab that will take that and stick it into the molecule of choice. Right next to it will be a PET scanner that will image patients with these new ligands and investigators will be studying so many new things uh, based on this, this, this technology from enabled by the cyclotron. Is this going to be un relatively unique or unique in this country in terms of the, uh, there, the coming together of all these yes, disciplines? Yes, I think there are several universities that have cyclotrons, some for physics, some for imaging. But I think in terms of putting all this set up with a high dedication for cancer research is probably unique. So, so, so to cut to the chase, this is going to allow us, you and researchers, to see, see things that so far we haven't been able to see. Correct. To follow yes. what's going yes. on at the cellular level yes. in a way we haven't been unable yes. to follow. We have, in, we have uh, advanced teams. We, have, we don't have the cyclotron yet, but we have advanced teams who are starting to do things. One team is trying to image an enzyme in breast cancer called aromatase. It's the enzyme that generates estrogens, which are the hormones that often drive the growth of breast cancer. That's why many breast cancer patients, especially women, take tamoxifen to uh, inhibit uh, breast cancer growth. Um, but Tamoxifen use of it is based on what a pathologist looks at the slide and says, oh, the estrogen receptor is high in this case, or maybe it's higher here, lower there. And they're sampling. They're not looking at the whole tumor. Or even if there are metastases, they're not looking at it everywhere. So that's a big limitation. Now we will be able to image the tumors that have this enzyme because there is a molecule that binds to it very, very strongly. So you give it to a patient, it will go to every cell that has a high level of aromatase, and now you know which patient has, is producing a lot of estrogens that will be detrimental. So you can target it in a very specific way. That's one advanced team. We have other advanced teams in terms of pancreatic cancer, uh, et cetera. So we're looking at multiple ways to advance uh, diagnostic abilities, abilities to tailor therapy, abilities to monitor therapy, by deploying tho those, uh, those new, new, uh, uh, new diagnostics based on the cyclotron. Let's talk a little bit about the Baal Center. And again, a little bit in the future, why is it going to be transformative? What is it going to allow you to do as a result of a multi-million dollar gift? Yeah, we're very fortunate, extremely fortunate that we have the Baal's, Kavita and Lalit Baal, uh, adopt our mission. Uh, they were very excited about our ability to bring together uh, physicists and mathematicians and imaging people and cancer biologists, etc. And they wanted to see that really empowered. Uh, so um, maybe two and a half years ago, uh, they donated three plus million dollars for us to be able to purchase the cyclotron. And just very recently, they donated another $10 million for us to be able to build human capacity and research capacity 
that builds on the availability of the cyclotron and that imaging suite. Meaning bringing in people too. Bringing in people, bringing in pilot projects. You know, and when we talk about bringing in people, we bring people from outside Stony Brook to Stony Brook to help us grow these. And we talk about bringing people from within Stony Brook to start maybe thinking of ways, you know, an applied mathematician who may not have thought much about cancer, we want them to start thinking about cancer and how they can help with that. And I think that's been an exciting area of growth for us at Stony Brook. We're getting a lot of interest from engineering and math and physics and chemistry in cancer problems and cancer issues. You, when we spoke a couple of days ago, you, you very firmly believe that anyone, certainly in this area, immediate or even in the region, who's, who has a cancer diagnosis, should come to Stony Brook for some evaluation. I believe that. We, we have an amazing team. Actually, we have amazing teams. Uh, we have, uh, because we are organized into disease teams. We have a breast cancer team. We have a prostate cancer team. We have a lung cancer team. We have a leukemia team, etc. We have top-notch uh, uh, physicians in those teams. And the teams involve, depending on the disease, uh, a surgeon, a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist. Um, we have Dr. Sam Ryu here somewhere, um, Sam who heads our radiation oncology and is also the director of clinical uh, medicine in the cancer center. Um, we've organized into amazing teams. Um, and w what I mean by that is we have folks in each of those areas who are not only aware of all the new things happening all the new information and all the new studies, but they are themselves part of that advanced force pushing the envelope against cancer. So they are developing new therapies. They are generating new trials. So they, these are the people who really know the nuances of what's changing. And I think it's, I would like for every patient who has cancer in our area to come talk to us at least once. You know, sometimes it's gonna be uh, routine, and then they're fine. They can take the routine or accepted therapy. Sometimes it's not, and they need to be aware of what's happening, uh, what's coming on in terms of clinical trials. Sometimes they start one way and end up in another way. They may start by taking routine therapy, but then they need something more advanced, such as immune therapy or some targeted therapy, et cetera. And, and this issue is going to become more and more complex as we realize that each patient almost becomes a, a diagnostic entity on, on his or her own. Even, even two patients with the same kind of cancer. What looks to the pathologist as the same kind of cancer, to the genomics person, a person who dissects the, the, the genomic sequence of that, they don't look alike at all. Uh, and if you put that, and that's only one component, if you put that also within the cancer biology and cancer metabolism aspect, they're gonna look very different. I, I wanna talk briefly about the American public, the, yes. the degree of education, the degree of knowledge. How does, how does today's patient learn enough to navigate this increasingly complicated terrain, which is hopeful, but yet complicated? Yes, I think this rapid change is creating this dilemma that not only a patient has issues with that, issues of access and understanding, but even doctors have issues with that. And if you're not a specialist in that area, engaged in the research in that area, you may feel like you're running behind. And, and so it, it's a real d consequence of the rapid change. That's why I go back to saying, if someone has cancer, go to the nearest, high-end academic center, find the specialists in that area, talk to them. One visit, and then sort out your strategy based on that. I think with that, we're going to throw this open to questions. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Hanoon. And now we, I'd like people to step up to the microphone if you have questions. Could you uh, speak a little bit about uh, how big pharmaceutical companies play into the concept of uh, cancer research? Uh, there is obviously some millions to be made. 
Uh, how do you feel they are uh, uh, playing their role? That, that, that's a good question. Uh, I've been long enough in cancer research that I've seen phases by which pharmaceutical companies have reacted. Um, I would say 20 years ago, they, most of them decided that cancer medicine was not profitable or worthwhile. Uh, and that was based on, again, that static concept of cancer, that there were those treatments, you know, uh, doxorubicin, cisplatinum, vincristin, uh, you may or may not recognize the names. These They've are all individual drugs. Individual that drugs that w have been around for 40 years almost. So, and they all became generic, and you know, cancer medicine is peanuts. It's not going to generate any pharmaceutical uh, revenue, uh, and it's not, even, it's not only the issue of revenue, it's because pharmaceuticals do have to spend billions to develop uh, new targets. But I think b back to that chronic myelogenous leukemia business, is that also ushered, that, that kind of defeated that concept too, because chronic myelogenous leukemia, this rare, very rare cancer of the blood, is a really rare cancer. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have the number, but it's got to be 0.1% or less of all cancers, probably much less than 0.1%. It's very rare. But it showed that if you have a treatment for that cancer, well, patients do well. They live longer. They need the treatment for years and years. And suddenly, even that obscure, relatively obscure disease became a billion-dollar market. So suddenly pharmaceuticals said, big pharmaceuticals said, oh, there is room to develop cancer therapeutic. So luckily, we're now in an era where most big pharmaceutical companies have been investing a lot into cancer research. And they are targeting specificities and the vulnerabilities we talked about. So this is a very different landscape than 20 years ago. Okay. Yes. So uh, my life has been deeply affected by cancer. I lost a brother when I was 15, and I lost my mother 11 years ago to cancer, very aggressive cancers, and it's left an indelible scar on me. Um, but I look at somebody like you, and I think, how do you do this every day? I mean, where do you put all that? And I'm just curious how someone who's invested their life's work into this gets through the emotional turmoil that goes along with this word. I mean, I'm sorry about your losses. We've all lost people to cancer. Um, I think, you know, we either close shop and go home or we double up and say we want to defeat cancers. Um, you know, we, and we want to do the best we can. So we want to look at what activities we can do that have the highest return. So some of us engage in patient care, some of us engage in research, some in combination. I mean, so we, we got to do it. Could you please comment on, like, the immune system? My feeling is that hey, there may be cancer in all of us, but the immune system, when it's working, keeps everything in check. But then in other people, so that's the question. What's going on with the immune system? Yeah, a lot. A lot is going on with the immune system. And I think your conjecture it's probably, that, that's my conjecture too. I don't think there are really solid data to prove it, but I think just from looking at the numbers, so to speak, it's obvious that we're generating mutated cells all the time and under usual conditions of both a normal immune system as well as the typical mutated cell or the majority of mutated cells, the immune system can attack that and get rid of it. Um, but what happens is back to this issue of the evolution and selection. So it's obvious now, more than ever, that part of the selection process is it selects for tumor cells that have learned how to evade the immune system. So there is a selection for that. So even if someone has a competent immune system, sometimes, and maybe not sometimes, maybe it is the times when those cells have learned to evade the immune system that we see cancer. And otherwise, we don't see it because it's under the surface and it's dealt with. So we see cancer when it has been selected to escape immune regulation. And now, people are 
understanding some of those mechanisms of escape of immune detection. And there are now therapies that target, I'm not sure you may have heard, immune checkpoint. It's, yes, this is immunotherapy. Immu this is what this we hear one, about. one form of form, immunotherapy. Which we hear a lot about, right? Yes, you're hearing a lot about it. It's one major form, not the only form, but one major form of immune therapy that's based on understanding how those cancers that become obvious, how they have been selected to disable this immune recognition. And then you intercede or intervene with that, and then now the immune system is capable of attacking the cancer cell. You had another question. This is more complicated, which I really don't understand. Um, and that's the concept of things that science proves this or that, and then people just totally ignore it. Global warming, we can go on and on. And you probably know where I'm going. I got out of the car today, and the cigarette butts were all over the place. People smoke, young people are smoking. What does the oncologist, what does the cancer researcher think or do about that? Can anything be done? I, I think a lot can be done. Uh, thank you for bringing up that uh, issue. Um, you know, we did a study a little over a year ago, no, yeah, a year, exactly a year ago, that we attributed a lot of cancers to what we call extrinsic factors. Uh, and we think a lot of those extrinsic factors are modifiable factors and therefore potentially preventable uh, factors and exposures. Uh, so there's a lot to be done in terms of more research about uh, what are those factors. For some cancers, it's obvious. Smoking, lung cancer, very obvious. For other, uh, UV light and skin cancer, uh, papillomavirus and, and cervical cancer. For others, it's not obvious that what the agent is, but it's obvious that there is exp environmental exposure, such as esophageal cancer or stomach cancer, etc. cetera. Uh, I, I can't agree more with you that um, we as a society and as individuals, we have a moral imperative to work harder into cancer prevention. Uh, as an oncologist, I don't have an ability to legislate or to influence people in general, but whenever I see a smoker, I advise them not to smoke. Um, <laughs> so um, I think we can all do something. Um, but, but, but I think you, you hit a very important point right on the head. So going back to the evolution of a tumor, um, things like colon cancer have a very defined set of genetic mutations that happen in a sequence very commonly. Um, but many other cancers are going to have, like you said, uh, a whole mishmash of different genetic mutations. Some of the cells will have two, some of them might have five. Um, is there anything with mathematicians and modelers like you were talking about earlier, if you sequence 500 cells out of a tumor, can you get a signature that tells you how far advanced into the series of mutations it has gone, so that could help to target which drugs might be best suited towards that? Or is that something that's so complex for each individual kind of cancer that you'd never be able to get an individual signature that could actually tell you something about how to treat it from that level? OK. Uh, maybe you want to sit down, because that's yeah. a long answer. <laughs> uh, so, um, so that capability exists, and people have performed not 500 cells, but dozens of mm -hmm. cells from a specific tumor, different regions mm -hmm. in the same tumor, and from metastases from that tumor. And people have been able to reconstruct an evolutionary tree of that tumor. So that's been done, and the, the tools are there, both in terms of sequencing ability to sequence the genes, uh, the DNA of each cell uh, at the cell level, or at least in a few cell level, uh, and the computational abilities to do that. So that's there. Um, the issue of kind of placing it in a sequence, unfortunately, is, so that part is probably going to be very difficult to address. There, th that's where complexity set in. We're 
we, we kind of understand the concept, but we haven't yet formulated uh, methods of approach and analysis that will enable us to do that. There's still gaps in knowledge there. You know, we do know, obviously, that smoking is related to lung cancer, but the vast majority of smokers don't get lung, you know, cancer. Uh, do those patients who smoke and don't get lung cancer, do they have a different repair mechanism that, you know, prevents these mutations that, you know, develop? Yeah, we, we don't know the answer totally to that question. But if one does some ana mathematical analysis, so there, every cell, normal cell, as it divides, it undergoes a small number of mutations. That's built in. That's why we are here. We have evolved because when cells divide, they're not 100% faithful. Otherwise, we'd still be single-celled organism. So we're here because of this built-in rate of, evol of mutation that powers evolution. Well, powers diversity and then natural selection works on that. So um, if, if you analyze that mutation rate and you look at how many uh, genes can be mutated to give you, for example, lung cancer or skin cancer, you find that every now and then that intrinsic mutation it may be sufficient to give you a mutation. There are just billions of cells that are dividing in your body at any one time. And every now and then, one of them is going to get a mutation in what we call a cancer-causing gene. Now, it's not sufficient because usually you need more than one gene. So there is still this built-in rate of bad luck, so to speak, that cancer will happen even if you don't smoke, if you do everything by the book, if you're very healthy, et cetera, et cetera, you still may get cancer. There is that built-in rate. We believe, based on our analysis, that that's a really small rate. But it still exists. Uh, so this is like playing Russian roulette, but you have a magazine with 20 bullet, uh, room for 20 bullets, but you load with one bullet. You, you're born with that, and you, you take a chance in, in life. Uh, now, when you're a smoker, you accelerate that rate of mutation. You generate more mutations. So instead of having one bullet, now you're loading your gun with six bullets. So you've really, or nine bullets, you've increased your, 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 uh, your, the probability of getting lung cancer. But you've not made it 100%. There is still probability that you know, even you smoke, you will pull the trigger and it will be a blank. There have been suggestions that dietary habits could help the prevention of, I mean, we all know the people who smoke more tendency for cancer. Are there dietary things that we can do to prevent this? I would say very little. Um, I don't want people to walk away from here thinking that, you know, if you lose weight, you're uh, never going to get sure cancer. Yet, uh, or if, you know, if you lose weight, you're not going to get cancer. Or if you don't eat fat, you don't. There are studies that show, for example, uh, Overweight or obese women are, have a, a higher likelihood of getting breast cancer. But that's going from here to here. So it's a small increment in that. Is it significant? Yes, it's a significant increment. But you, know, you, you remove that, you still have the big chunk of breast cancer. Um, it's an area dear to our heart and our research back to the ball center because we're interested in metabolism. And metabolism at the cell level is what dictates what you're talking about in terms of diet. You, you eat diet, but that ends up being metabolism at the level of the cell. We're very interested in, because we know a lot about metabolism at the cell level, we're interested in understanding how diet affects that metabolism. If, you, if, you ha if your diet has more one form of fat than the other, is that different? Is that accelerate or prevent cancer? We don't know the answer to these questions. So I think this is an area that sounds it sounds almost stupid that we don't know much about. We don't know much about. Um, but I think it's an important area. And the last thing I want for people to walk away saying that there is a magic recipe for diet and behavior that's going to prevent cancer. You know, don't smoke. Don't get too much UV sunlight. Get vaccination for uh, papilloma virus, vaccination for hepatitis C, uh, et cetera. All that, 
yes, uh, but in terms of you know, don't eat nuts or eat this or. Uh, we're not there. Thank you very much. Maybe you take one bullet out of the chamber, but they're yeah. still. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. yes. Uh, what do you think about these increased rates of you know cancer in the 9/11 first responders? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, we, you know, we follow a large cohort of the first responders here on Long Island at Stony Brook, and we do have a, a large number of cancers. We don't have a, an answer to that question. I mean, we, we follow that cohort. We're now following their families, um, and we, we, we want to investigate that. You know, they, I don't think there was asbestos there, but there could have been asbestos. I, I, I mean, we don't know what exposure they've had. There were many people in their 30s and 40s who got cancers that we associated with older in, uh, individuals. So you have to assume that there was probably some I guess carcinogenic uh, uh, things there, although the EPA was telling us that it was fine, you know, which obviously wasn't, you know, correct. Right, but then, I mean, unfortunately, with such a yeah. calamity, there were probably multiple exposures. Yeah. So whereas maybe a little cadmium here and a little chromium there or something wouldn't, but, you know, the combination of things, may, we, we don't know the answer. We can guess, but we really don't know the answer to that. But we're following those patients. We want to understand what's happening. We do want to figure it out. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question, if there is one more. Okay, this is the last one. You mentioned that scientists tend to be uh, very specialized in what they do and their research. And you also mentioned that for the future of um, the Cancer Center, we're going to have a lot of different disciplines coming together. Do you think this is going to be a change in the way we are trained, us early scientists? Is this going to be important to really make that um, progress in cancer research? In, in terms of uh, having broader education? or Yeah, and being able to work with different in dis, uh, multidisciplinary teams, being able to learn how to work with multidisciplinary teams. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I think scientists should learn better how to work with each other given that this is the ALDA Center, they should learn better how to communicate with each other. Um, I do think, um, that's my bias, that scientists should, uh, especially biological science, cancer biology scientists, should acquire more understanding of advanced mathematical skills. Uh, but probably more important than that is just communicating, interacting, because What's more important than me knowing to do what you do is more important to understand what you do and how you use it and then work with you because you bring that expertise and I bring a different expertise. So I think the interface is more important than kind of having to train across the board, but learn how to communicate and how to ap appreciate the different components that come into, into cancer research. Thank you. Well, you know, there's no one in this room who, in one way or another, hasn't been touched by cancer. And I think what you've managed to do tonight, among other things, is put a, a real a face and a, and, a, and a mind behind the extraordinary scientists and researchers who are attempting to understand the human body in ways that we just cannot even imagine in terms of how profound your understanding is and will be. So on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you very much. For thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.